Hello, it's Roger Bisbee here from Skill Builder, and here is another episode of Ask Skill Builder. We're doing really well with this. We've got loads of questions coming in, and we're very grateful for that. And also, we're grateful for the comments that are coming in as well beneath them, because that makes it a lot more entertaining and a lot more useful to people, because obviously, the more opinions you can get, the better. And it's not just about questions. You know, if you're DIY, that's fine, or you're having building work done, we want those questions. But also, if you've got anything weird and wacky, you just want to show us something that you think is interesting, funny or alarming, then send those in as well. So here's a question from Gary Maju. Now, Gary's said in three photographs here, and he said what alerted him to the problem was that he saw a little wet patch, a little mark on the, the plasterboard ceiling below. And he looked outside and he could see these white mystery marks on the lead flashing. So what I think is going on here is that the lead has cracked. Now it's cracked because it's been put in in one piece and you should never ever put a piece of lead in in one piece. The maximum that you should have in the way of a lead flashing is 1.5 meters, in other words, five feet. And that is with what they call code four lead, which is four pound lead. Now, in this case, it looks to me, there's no way of knowing for sure, but it looks to me like they've used some code 3 lead which is a little bit cheaper a little bit lighter and if you're using code 3 lead you can only go to a maximum of a meter with it instead of one and a half meters and the reason is because lead expands and contracts in the sun and he said this is a south facing aspect so as that lead contracts and expands it starts to buckle and if it is in too long a length it can't expand enough and it will buckle in those places and those buckles will eventually lead to cracks now what he said is he's got there's some white sort of furry stuff coming up through the, the cracks and that's what made him notice them now what that is is that when you put lead onto a roof you're supposed to put what they call patination oil on the lead which is just an oil that you put on which stops it from going white stops that oxidization on the lead a lot of people put that on the front but they don't put it on the underside of the lead and normally that wouldn't be a problem because you would never see the underside of a lead but what's happened here is because it's cracked the oxidization from the underside is crept up through the crack and appeared on the on the top surface of the lead as a white mark so that's not the end of the world that's not the problem the problem is that that lead is being put in in too long a length and really speaking the only thing i can think he can do with it is to take it out you could cut it into one meter strips in situ and then put a cover piece over each of those joins a six inch cover piece over each of those joins but it starts to look a mess i think if i were doing it i would take the whole lot out i'd put in some code 4 lead because code 4 is really what you should be using and uh, and make sure it doesn't exceed 1.5 meters in length and then it will be fine Hi Roger, my problem is that I have this damp patch developing on a bedroom wall. It's just below the window, which is a double glazed unit installed about 10 years ago. It's the top right one in this picture and it gets the worst of the weather. I know the wall construction's cavity wall and it's got these pellets blown into it at some stage and I think the water tracking across those. As far as I can see, all the seals around the outside are okay and I've added extra mastic taking off any bad stuff. It's slightly damp in this corner. You can see the seal, uh, the decorative seals coming off, but below it seems to be tracking through and getting really bad. Any idea how I can stop this? This is tricky. You know, damp is always one of those things that people jump to conclusions with damp. They all know what this is. Now, Phil, he saw this damp appearing around the edges of his window and he thought it was the mastic seal around the edge of the window. So he did all that. He went around and sealed it all up. Six months later, it's back again. That's interesting. Why did it take six months? Could it be seasonal? We've got a good picture here of cavity wall insulation, which is this polystyrene beads that they used to put in. Now, I know you do get some problems with that, that system where the damp migrates across the cavity. So I don't know. That's what I'm going to say, Phil, quite honestly. And it'd be very interesting to get some comments from other people below and see what they think. There are the possibilities here is that we've got penetrating damp from, from the outside to the inside, but it's rendered. The wall looks rendered. Okay, there's a bit of paint flaking off in that top left-hand corner there, up in the gable, you can see. But other than that, the render looks pretty good. So why is he getting damp in through that render? If he's eliminated the seal around the edge, it could be 
that he's got cold bridging coming there. Now, they look like aluminium frames he's got in there. So the cold bridging is when you get thermal transference from the outside to the inside, jumps the cavity insulation, if you like. So you get that around window frames, you get that just around the edges. And if you've got a high level of moisture in the house, in other words, you've got humidity in the house, you know, your, your extractor fans aren't doing the job, people are breathing, obviously that's letting out moisture. So in a bedroom at night, for example, you've got all that moisture that's built up from two people breathing, it's drifting around and obviously as it finds a cold spot like around the edge of the window frame it forms there now why it should have formed around this socket the only thing i can think about there is that there's a bit of cavity insulation missing because when they blow that in it is a bit hit and miss and if you get a void what you get is a warm wall and then you get one little point which is cold and on that cold spot, the, the moisture will condense. So I don't think, if he looks on the outside of where that socket is, it doesn't look like there's anything on the outside which should be causing that damp on the inside. So it's got two chances. One, that it's coming down from around the window, or the other, it's condensation. Now, if it's condensation, the interesting thing to do would be to get a couple of Unibond, the little moisture traps, Put those in you can get them from tesco's or anywhere just put them on the windowsill and see how much moisture they gather over the course of 24 hours and that will give you a clue as to how much humidity is in the house because i'm thinking that what he needs there is a bit of ventilation he needs to get rid of some of that moisture from within the house but we don't know this so rather than jump to conclusions and go down the wrong path what i say is let's prove this first of all let's let's have a look at the humidity in the house and let's try and find out whether it is at a high level and if it is at a high level try to cure that try to get some good extractor fans in there open those windows get a bit of ventilation in there don't try and clean it off with bleach by the way because bleach apparently is hydroscopic it will attract new moisture so even though it gets rid of the ugly black mold it will attract new moisture in its place so use a use a proprietary fungicidal wash les richards wants to put a level transition decking that he wants the outside decking to be exactly the same level as the floor so he's got a nice transition through i understand that a lot of people want that the first thing is he's worried about damp which is quite right because you've got a damp proof course out there and you shouldn't bridge the damp proof course you should actually stay six inches below the damp proof course to stop any splash up from coming over the top having said that we've got cavity walls nowadays so if the outside skin gets a little bit of a soak in it doesn't always mean that the inside starts to get rising damp he's got a nice gully there he's showing us a gully so he can put in what they call a bit of echo drain there are other makes available but that's a drain a sort of slotted channel if you like with a mesh over the top now you can get this in stainless steel and you can also get it in plastic black plastic and you can also get a very nice one which has just got a little groove in it so you hardly see it at all but the idea is that any water that comes close to the house is taken away at that point other than that what you need to do is to put down some weed barrier geotextile they call it and just put that down to stop any weeds from growing up through the decking and then you can either just put down little pad stones the way i like to do it is just put small holes if you like in the ground and, and then maybe a bit of plastic pipe and then just put a bit of concrete into those so you make lots of little stilts now if you do them out of concrete rather than out of timber you don't have any rot issues with them and what i then do is i use usually put just a little bit of damp proof course over the top of that concrete pad and then put the timber onto the top of there there is another way of doing it with jacking screws which are screws which you just place into the concrete and then when they're set you just wind them up and down and the great thing about those is that you've got a little bit of adjustment you can make sure that all your levels are absolutely perfect before you go now if you're using composite decking there's an awful lot of this around nowadays but you need to decide what composite decking you're going to use before you start now for anybody who doesn't know what composite decking is it's a non-wood version of decking so it doesn't rot and so on very good pretty expensive but one of the things you've got to watch out for is how much support you need because whereas you can get away with 400 millimeter centers on your joists with a wooden deck on some of that composite decking you've got to close up those joists to 300 millimeters which is a foot so 
because they haven't got quite the same structural strength as, as some of the timber, you need to put in more supports. So it, the worst thing is if you built the whole of the structure first, the framework, and then you decided which decking you were going to get, and you saw, oh no, I need to put in 300 millimeter centers on the timber, and you wouldn't have enough support for it. So it's very important that you work all that out before you start. Do a little sketch of it. Make sure you know exactly where you're going with it, and make sure when you cut the decking that you make sure that the ends are supported over a joist so you haven't got any free flying bits in the middle which you sometimes see people doing they just they just i think because they don't want to waste any decking they just randomly put them in in lengths and uh, sometimes they're not properly supported but if you do all that then there's no reason why you shouldn't have a, a perfectly good decking but you've got to think about that drainage issue and as i say the weed barrier is also essential because life will become a misery for you if you have weeds growing up through it so now we've got a question from Jim Kane, and Jim has just recently moved from Atlanta to Ely in Cambridge. So that's a hell of a shock to the system, isn't it? I reckon. I don't know. I've never been to Atlanta, but um, anyway, there he is in Ely, and he's getting to grips with English building. He said he's done a lot of work on houses in the States, but he doesn't know an awful lot about British building, if you like first thing is hot water system he's not getting much pressure he's got pumped it's very noisy and he wants to put some more showers in better showers and he's saying i don't know what the solution is but i'm thinking maybe i can put in an unvented cylinder should he do that is that the best option well it is jim but it's not a given that you've got enough flow and pressure. So what the first thing you've got to do is to carry out the flow and pressure test and see what kind of water pressure and flow rate you've got coming into the house. And you can talk to your local water company up there and see if they'll assist you in this, um, tell you what you've got. Uh, one thing I would say is always check that the stopcocks are fully open, the one in the, the street as well as the one into your house. I've been to a house where they'd suffered for years with low flow rate on their water and they've just gone, oh, it's a nightmare, nothing works very fast, you know, and they, they put up with it for years and years. And I thought, I'll just have a look. And I just went out into the, the road, into the street, the path, if you like, and um, got my stopcock key out and I found that I got three complete turns on the stopcock in the street and lo and behold in the house suddenly they got a lovely flow of water that they'd never had before and honestly you know the lady almost kissed me and she didn't but there you go um so well so check that out first Jim have a look at your flow and your pressure uh, you can do a, a test on the pressure, static pressure, with a little pressure gauge and also just fill a bucket up, see how long it takes to fill it up and how many litres a minute you've got coming in there. The other thing he's saying, and I can understand this if you live in Ely, he's saying that the water is incredibly hard there. And it is. It's um, it, ang angly water, I guess, up there. I don't know, but but it is. It's, it's nasty old stuff. So he's saying he's not sure what he should do about this, a water softener or a reverse osmosis unit in there. Now, they're two different things. The water softener is for softening the water. That makes it all lovely and it makes all of the lava, you know, the soap lather up well and makes your hair soft and your skin nice and everything else. And that's a very good thing. But the reverse osmosis thing is a filter for the taste of the water. Now, if you're worried about the taste of the water, if, in other words, if you've been buying bottled water, then you might want to look at a reverse osmosis filter which is a very efficient water filter as an addition. But they're two different things that you, some people confuse this and they say, you know, it, 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 sometimes it's the fault of the people selling these things that they've said to people, oh yeah, this is like a water softener as well. And of course it does nothing to soften the water. It filters out some of the stuff, sure enough, but it still leaves you with, with hard water. So those two things, separate, but both worth doing in that area. So yeah, I think you're not going to get away if you're used to nice quality water, you're not going to get away with it without doing that. I wouldn't go for one of these magnets or something like that because they won't give you, they, they, they help in terms of reducing scale in your boiler, but they don't do anything to soften the water really. So it's always the water softener, uh, which is a sodium based thing. So now we've got a question from Jimmy and Jim is a builder and he doesn't want us to use his real name because obviously you know why he's saying that he's experiencing a lot of cracks 
in the ceilings. When he's putting up new ceilings, he finds that after a while he's getting his hairline cracks along them and uh, he's having to go back. And he said, it's not only him, but a lot of builders are experiencing this problem. When I used to do a lot of loft conversions, I'd always say to the, the customer that in around six months time, they would have to get a decorator in and they would have to go around and they would have to fill in all those little hairline cracks and so on. Now, the reason I said that is not because we didn't do a good job of scrimming the joints, but because the timber was invariably wet. You're doing a, a roof structure or something like that. You've got what is sometimes soaking wet timber stored outside. So you're putting it into that building and as you're fixing it all together and you're bolting it all up, you tighten up the nuts and it's really tight. You go back there a week later and you can get another couple of four turns on the, on the nuts. It's an indication of just how much moisture is running out of those timbers. So if you're trying to get the job done fairly quickly, as people want you in and out on the loft conversion, you haven't got time to let that timber dry out before you start plasterboarding. So the timber shrinks and no amount of scrim joint, this is the fiberglass tape they use between the two sheets of plasterboard, no amount of that scrim will stop that cracking. Some people just go, oh yeah, they didn't use scrim, but you'll find they do, and that scrim will tear just like that. What's going to stop it? You know, if you think about it, you've got a piece of timber that's drying out and it wants to move apart, and you're trying to stop it with a bit of fiberglass tape. It's not going to happen. So you either let the timbers dry out completely before you start doing this, or my solution is that you leave a little bit of a, a gap, a penny, a penny joint, as I would call it, between each piece of plasterboard when you fix it rather than butting it up. And that allows you to get a bit of plaster in behind the scrim as well as on top of it. Now, a lot of people butt those joints up, they put the scrim tape over the top of it and then they plaster onto it. So if you think about it, you've got three millimeters of plaster on that joint at best quite honestly a lot of the time and it's really not enough to cover the joint back in the day when we used to use hessian scrim which in my opinion is a hell of a lot better it was thicker it was like sacking and if you try to take it like old buildings if you go into to buildings which were built sort of 50 years ago and you start doing renovations on them and you've got to take a ceiling down that's been done with hessian scrim you have you find you have to actually tear the boards apart it's really difficult to get them apart so in my opinion using the hessian scrim as it used to be and it's not around anymore you can't even buy it but what you used to do then is you used to put a layer of a coat of plaster on the joint it wasn't self-adhesive scrim as they are now so you put a coat of plaster on that joint then you would bed in your hessian scrim into that plaster and then as that went off you would put your top coat of plaster on so you built up a thicker joint on that that on on the joints between the boards and sometimes you can see them sometimes if you look across the ceiling you can see where the joint's gone slightly thicker over the joints and then it's thinned out but if you're a good plasterer you get over that you don't have that problem but again it's one of those things in the modern age they're just using a bit of self-adhesive scrim the timbers are wet the boards are butted up so so it's a very thin coat of plaster over there Added to that, and I don't know whether this is true or not, but I'm going to do a bit of investigation with British Gypsum and also with Canal, who make plasterboards, and see if they've got anything to add to this, because what's also happening is that we're not getting pure gypsum in the plasterboard anymore. We're getting a lot of recycled material from power stations, things like that. We're also getting recycled plasterboard. You know, when you take your plasterboard down to the recycling plant now, a lot of that is finding its way back into products. So who knows? Who knows what? that has happened to plasterboard in recent years maybe and i don't know this i'm not saying this so let's have your input on this tradesman out there plasterers out there and uh, i think that there may be some different characteristics in the plasterboard obviously the plasterboard has got to dry out if it gets damp if it's being stored in a shed or somewhere where it's getting a little bit damp it will contract and uh, you can look up the coefficients of thermal expansion on plasterboard and you can see that there's about on a, on a long 
ceiling you might get about three millimeters of expansion and contraction on that length now interestingly the other thing is that we're also having bigger rooms now because we're doing all these knock throughs rather than having small rooms where you wouldn't necessarily notice that little bit of shrinkage in the plasterboard because it may take place around the edges now because you've got a long run of, of a room you've got a much longer ceiling so if you think about it if you've got a ceiling that's about 20 feet long say now sorry to use old measurements but if you if you look at something that's 20 30 feet long then you can understand that there's likely to be more scope for cracks in a ceiling like that than there is in a short one so that's just my input and i'd love to have your input anybody wants to add something to this and we'll do a little bit more investigation on it <laughs>